broadcast. Welcome to Idea the ITO. My name is Rob. I organize Idea the ITO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 100,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 2,392 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days, we're 100% online. We have an event nearly every day of the week. Check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. At this point, I'm gonna hand it off to our distinguished moderator, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Okay, thanks, Rob. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, attendees, for being here. Thank you, Idea to IPO for creating this event and asking me to moderate. I'm Roger Royce, your moderator. I am a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone, resident in the Silicon Valley office. And I'll be your moderator today for our panel, Venture Capital Funding for Startups in the COVID-19 Era. Uh, a couple of quick things before we get going. Um, this is <clears throat> one of a series of IDEA to IPO events. Uh, you'll see me here about every other Tuesday. Uh, on either a venture panel or a topic of interest. Our next one coming up is going to, is actually going to be a, a repeat with some new content, a repeat of an old topic, new content. Um, startups in a down economy, because uh, I think some people would say we're either in a down economy or heading there. So tune in for that. That'll be in a couple of weeks. Uh, look for more information. So for today's uh, presentation, uh, we're going to have a panel for one hour, and then at one o'clock Pacific, I'm going to open it up to questions. So you'll think of questions as we get into this. Type them in the Q&A box. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat box that says Q&A. Type your questions there. Don't type them in the chat box. Type them in the Q&A box. I'll gather them up, and uh, we'll get to them at the end of, uh, end of the panel. Uh, secondly, I want to let you know that this is being recorded. Uh, you'll find a recording of this panel on the Idea to IPO YouTube site eventually, and you'll find it on a, a YouTube site for Royce Law. If you look for Royce Law YouTube, you'll find it there probably by the end of the day, certainly by tomorrow. So if you want to go back and go over something that might have been said, you can find the recording. So finally, before we get going, I would like to know who is in our audience. We're all coming to you from Silicon Valley. Um, I know it looks like I'm sitting in the idea to IPO offices. I'll let you believe that if you want. Um, but we're all from Silicon Valley here. I know there are people here from around the world from a lot of different areas. And uh, typically, uh, so it looks like we got about half entrepreneurs. We've got a couple of investors. We have uh, a handful of, uh, well, 20, 15% that identify as techies. We've got some academics this time. That's not that often that we get people from the universities. So we've got a few academics and a handful of service providers like me. This is with about three quarters of you voting. I'll go for a couple more seconds. Uh, all right, so it's 70%, two thirds entrepreneurs will Tell you what, I'll share the results so you can get an idea of who's here uh, that are in the audience. So we'll tailor our comments, I think, probably towards the entrepreneur, entrepreneur community. You know what, because I'm so inquisitive and I'm nosy, I also wanna know where you're from. Um, so let's see, like I say, we're here in Silicon Valley, but we broadcast this all over the world with uh, remote and Zoom meetings, et cetera. We get attendees from everywhere now, uh, depending on time zone. And it looks like about a third, 40% are Silicon Valley, a couple people from other parts of the US. 
no one yet from China, that doesn't surprise me, um, given a time zone. Europe, a quarter of the people are from Europe. We've got uh, five people from Canada and Mexico and uh, one person from other parts of Asia. Okay, so it is about half a Silicon Valley audience, primarily a US audience with a handful of folks, a dozen people from Europe and Canada. All right, so that's it with the polling. Okay, the topic today, venture capital panel, funding for startups in the COVID-19 era. You might remember those of you who are good followers and viewers that we did this program in March. Uh, we call it, how will COVID-19 affect funding for startups? Now we're gonna find out how has COVID-19 affected funding from startups from our panel of venture capitalists. We have Ephraim Lindenbaum. He's the managing director of Advanced Ventures. He's the He's also the founder. It's a Silicon Valley-based venture investment fund and venture accelerator. They invest in seed and early stage startups. Nuno Goncalves, Pedro Venture Partner, Grishan Robotics Venture Capital, Managing Partner, Strive. Is it Strive or Strive? We'll call it Strive. 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 Okay. We're not <laughs> thriving guy. yet, but we are striving for sure. Ah, there you go. Yes. Founder and managing partner, uh, it's a quantitative early stage venture capital fund focused on early stage consumer mobile. And Joe Jason, managing director of DNA Partners, an early stage venture capital investment firm. They invest in digital media value chain technology companies in the US and China. Um, it says you spend 20 to 30% of your time in China, probably not lately, uh, but uh, historically, right? Yes, indeed. So with, with that, um, as is my custom, before I jump into uh, Rob's questions and my digressions, I guess I'd like to ask each of you to just kind of give me your summary of how things have changed since the last time we were here uh, and uh, how um, funding, not so much how it will affect funding for startups, how has it affected funding from startups at a high level, this big picture, general picture? We'll start with you, Ephraim, since I listed you first. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for inviting us as well. Glad to be back with uh, my cohorts here on the panel. So, you know, in terms of how it's affected, I mean, I think I, I think it has played out in, in, in a way very, very similarly to what we've seen in, in prior downturns in the broader economy. You know, venture tends to be the canary in the coal mine. Startups tend to be the canary in the coal mine. When, when our market tends to get tougher, uh, the, the broader, it, you know, uh, economy tends to fall a little behind. Now, you know, that being said, there is a tremendous amount of venture capital. There is a lot of cash on the balance sheet, so to speak, of the venture funds. So we are deploying capital, but I think we're being a little more nimble. We, we, we have seen significant, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of pullback in terms of valuations. We've seen a flight to quality amongst our companies, uh, other than certainly COVID-related companies. Uh, you know, we've seen some, you know, uh, down, you know, di di drops in valuation, a few down rounds. Um, but I think, I think the most interesting thing, at least from our uh, ventures perspective is, you know, new deals are a brand new uh, world for us. So the way we look at deals, um, you know, is not that dissimilar from what we had. The way that we, uh, you know, sort of meet the entrepreneurs and fund deals have changed. Uh, you know, we tend to deploy larger checks than, uh, you know, eat seed or uh, angel type funds. So, you know, I think for the most part, we are co-investing uh, more so than not with other VCs who have been the initial money into the deal. They tend to know the entrepreneurs. We're relying on our colleagues' representation of the entrepreneur versus the amount of time that we typically have uh, would have sat across the table from that person. So, you know, I think that's changed a little bit in our mind. I think deal sourcing um, is, is certainly more interesting today, but, but venture is happening. Venture continues forward. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Nuno? Sure, so I think when we, when we had this conversation six months ago, uh, if I remember the same crowd, uh, we were probably mostly right. I think we were identifying that there was going to be a realignment of valuations going down, as F was just talking about, um, that there would be some sparse investment in the space. But, you know, I think some, the, the degree of selectivity, I think I mentioned back then that it was going to be, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a sort of a cherry on the pie type decision. You know, you can cherry pick uh, literally what investments you want to make and you don't want to make and, and be a little bit more selective actually in how you're going to market. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of companies fundraising. 
uh, and certainly, um, and certainly, I think the the job of a venture capitalist, in some ways, has become more difficult because of the noise. But on the other hand, you can be more selective because there's a lot more stuff probably f- to choose from. Um, the other element I've seen is it seems like the actual amount of capital deployed hasn't decreased dramatically, certainly in certain sub areas like software as a service and a few others. But if you look really closely, actually the number of deals has declined a lot, which means there's more capital per deal being deployed, which means it's probably more mid to late stage that's being deployed right now. Uh, so a little bit more conservative as well. Um, if I look at public markets, uh, it, it, normally we don't talk about public markets because obviously we are early stage investors and we focus a lot in that space. Uh, one of my companies IPO'd through a reverse merger, DraftKings. So very, very happy with that and glad we have a lockup <laughs> and we didn't feel tempted to sell our our stock. Um, and so, so, so it's really interesting because in some ways I think there is a little bit of a bubble emerging now in some sub areas of public markets, software a service, I think there's a little bit of a bubble right now. Uh, you have companies trading at 18x forward revenues, which is like really, uh, you know, even with stupid growth rates, it would be difficult. So, so there's almost like a passage right now. Everyone's putting their money into tech because tech is going to save us all. And so I think that's one effect that maybe we didn't predict uh, back then. So, that, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that maybe is different from, from our last conversation. The second element um, that we sort of semi-predicted um, was the ability of venture capital firms to raise funds themselves, uh, which is, you know, obviously much more complex, much more difficult. Um, this is a high-touch sport, so raising significant funds at this stage, unless you have a lot of prior committed LPs, uh, if you're a tier one fund, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's a little bit trickier. So I feel maybe there I would say it's even worse than I thought it would be um, from, from my perspective. Um, my, from my end, things are going well now, but it, it really took us a while to figure out what was our approach to fundraising our next fund. And you know, we're still deploying capital from um, our previous fund at Strive. And also I still deploy capital from Grishin Robotics, but you know, was in the midst of fundraising for my fund three and COVID was just a wall. Uh, and now we've passed around the wall. I, I don't think we went through the wall, but we went around the wall when we found alternatives to it. But, but that has been much more difficult than I thought it would be. And it's more prolonged. I think the third thing that I would say um, is, you know, at that stage, I believe I, I talked about a year and a half to two years of we're going to go in the, into this situation of COVID in the U.S., And in some ways, in my mind, I was thinking, I'm saying one and a half to two years being a realist and maybe maybe too pessimist, too much of a pessimist. And right now it looks like that's probably the best we can get away with, certainly right now in the U.S. So I'm, um, you know, I I spent a month in Portugal where it felt that we were close to the new normal, uh, although Portugal now has increased as well over the summer. And, and coming back to the U.S., I'm like, we're sort of still stuck where we were, right? That This doesn't seem like we're moving <laughs> much further. So this is not really a political comment, but just realizing that um, one last thought I'd leave is, um, you know, the, the different regions of the world are going to manifest themselves in very different ways. And we're starting to see Asia reopening in many, in many cases. Uh, and parts of Europe have done some reopening and back and forth. Germany, for sure, is still probably pretty ahead of the curve. So I think we'll continue seeing that. And, and that will change a lot of the dynamic around distributed teams, where do you raise money from, et cetera, et cetera, as well, which in our first conversation, we didn't discuss in, to, 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 a, to a large extent. Okay. Joe, your, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I want to share that, you know, up, some upfront context of who we are, uh, DNA Partners. I know we, we broached that a bit, but we're investing in software, in infrastructure of digital media. Our geographies are USA, China, and now we've been sourcing for the last year, uh, the Philippines. And today I just want to think, think, you know, contextually and the full spectrum from incubation or seed to IPOs. I think it's, it's, we've been in this for about six months now, COVID, and I think it is important for us to cover the full spectrum and our interpretations of what that spectrum is from month one to month six, six being today. Um, if I had one word to label it, it would be elasticity. Uh, it seems like we're just elastic um, in our philosophies of investing 
and the rationales are, uh, I would just put the other word, bizarre. Um, uh, so contextually, that's where I want to come from. Um, you know, we've done 113 IPOs in 2020. 2016, I think we did 102, 105. 2016, we did 105. So we're already above that from 2016. Uh, so that's obviously public offering. And then we go to the other spectrum of incubation and seed. We don't have all the numbers collected on that for the USA, but I would say that it's down considerably. That's just my interpretation uh, and my uh, hypothesis. But I would like to say that there's been, you know, not, you know, July, August, there's been uptake in more and more investments. And I think that the, the money is getting restless in its accounts and it's time for the entrepreneurs to reach out to us, to be more proactive. Um, on our last call in March, idea to IPO, uh, I was really aggressive in saying, please reach out because correspondence is gonna be key because we're not going to face-to-face -face meetings. So I'd like to say that one to six months, as far as the entrepreneurs out there, correspondence has been lower for us than in the physical world. And that it, who did correspond with us we really feel like there's more confidence and conviction in these executives, which allows us to move faster uh, and with more discipline at an at a accelerated pace. So in this time, it really uh, brings out, it percolates up the transparency of executives and how they approach their companies in general, how they approach us. So I just wanted to share that uh, present tense context. Yeah, you know, Joe, I think what you're saying is consistent with, uh, with the, the facts, the stats that I saw in the money tree about investment. Seems there was a dip, but I've heard that it's, that it's back. What have you been seeing? Let's just stick with you for a minute. In terms of valuations, uh, there was a prediction, I forget who made it, uh, six months ago, that valuations were going to go way down. Uh, has that happened? Or are we in, uh, Nuno, you mentioned a bubble. Or, or are we in a... You know, how did, I don't you mentioned a bubble for software as a service. It's just been a lot of uptake. public public well, companies. Yeah, companies well, public companies. How about early stage? I think we're mostly early stage. I mean, audience. yeah. I so so I mean, you know, it, it really depends. I think it's more of a realignment story. I, I don't think anybody is in a position to make any you know across the board you know uh, pronouncements on this. I mean, we are seeing companies on our end that are getting significant up rounds beyond software as a service. Our food and egg companies are doing very, very well. I think we predicted that happened. Our health tech companies are getting valuations that feel like the internet bubble. So I, you know, I, I think really what it comes down to are great deals and how important it is and, and how valuable that company is in this new economy. And you know, companies that are you know, gaining traction, gaining market share, generating revenue in this market, um, you know, I, I, I think are, are, are being well treated. I think what, what, what's happened is patience has, has thinned, right? I mean, this, you know, geez, three years in where, you know, we've inched the ball a few yards up the field that, you know, I think everybody has gotten a lot more realistic. I think, you know, people have their brush with, you know, uh, you know, uh, sort of looking into the abyss and, you know, we're just, you know, we can't sit around and, you know, kick tires on a lot of these deals. So I do see, you know, VCs, you know, uh, you know, cut and bait, so to speak, um, in a lot of ways that maybe they hadn't done before. You know, some of them are taking the hits to the, uh, you know, to the to the fund, to the portfolio, to to, to clear it out. And uh, you know, one thing that we are seeing is is redeployment of capital, right? Uh, you know, release the follow-on offer, uh, op, you know, requirement on deals that are not performing, you know, and move on. And I think. If anything, VCs have had more time to probably do a deeper dive into their own portfolio and, you know, root out some of the dead wood, I would say. So, so that's my take, um, you know, at, I, at my level. I, I think I was the one that made that prediction back then that valuations were going to come down. And uh, I'd like to say, I think I got the two elements of that really well, which is, I do think the median and average has come down. You see people being a little bit more precise, even raising less money instead of it's a series A, it's a series seed one, or it's a, a seed and not an A, or it's a pre seed and not a seed and so redefining how much money they're they're raising you know with uh you know price caps that are i think a little bit nicer uh, the conditions are moving 
slowly but surely better and better to our side, to, to investors and venture capitalists. We're getting better conditions. I feel we're getting to negotiate better conditions as well. Uh, I think we had a really long period, as you were mentioning last time, Roger, where we had um, you know entrepreneurs dictating stuff in the Bay Area and it's being very entrepreneur friendly. I think we're now moving a, a bit to the other way, maybe, maybe not as aggressively as we had anticipated six months ago, but certainly moving the other way. Um, I had to also predict it back then that the hot companies would always raise. I think the one thing I totally missed is I had not predicted that the companies, the hot companies with, uh, that would always raise would raise at stupid valuations now. And it's a little bit the same effect we're seeing on, on public markets, right? It's like everyone's putting their money to Amazon, Apple, whatever, right? Because it's like, it seems like they're the guys who are doing well, right? So we might as well, right? And um, it feels the same in some cases in some deals in early stage. Uh, I've seen a couple of deals that are like back to the old parity rounds, but it's like seed deals, right? That are raising five to 10 million in seed at some absurd valuations where you're like, surely, this can't be worth that in the next five years or so, right? So, so, so I think there's a little bit, I wouldn't call it a bubble, but there's a little bit of an over-anticipation. There's limited number of hot assets, either hot teams or hot products or hot areas. And I feel there's maybe a little bit of a lemming mentality of investors, including venture capitalists, deploying too much capital onto them and accepting very wild valuations. But in general, I think we were right uh, six months ago. I think valuations have come down on median and average, et cetera, et cetera. It's just the extreme position feels to me like it's gone way off the deep end. And getting back to valuations where Roger wanted us to just highlight it. Um, I think, you know, I agree with you. And halfway through your last uh, comments, I was totally on mark with you. I was thinking, 20% of the hot companies, or let's just say 20% of the companies out there, and I'm speaking about USA and China right now, they wanted to go for really high valuations. They were just going for it. Like we have a lot of momentum. This is what we want. And then 80% of the companies were just like, okay, we're rational. Here we are. Um, we don't know if we're going to be able to get sales. It's the unknown abyss that we're going into. So I would put an 80, 20 on that. And you know, it's that's quite an extreme um that's not a frothy bubble so to speak you know you know if you said something that i want to follow up on you're talking about some of the companies that have been doing well uh and i i really want to make sure we talk about that what what has been doing well in this new economy i mean we all know what's you know we can guess what's not doing well but draft what's... kings draft kings is doing well <laughs> sorry yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Congratulations, Nuno. Um, yeah, so, so again, I mean, it, it's really sector-based. I mean, I think the number one thing that, that I would say it's our, you know, science project, you know, early stage startups are really, you know, a little harder to get funded today. Um, you know, it, it really comes down to essentials, you know, and, you know, reasonable companies in health tech that have a COVID bend are doing really, really well. Uh, you know, we're seeing tremendous traction in our food and ag companies. They're, they're, they're really uh, have done very well. You know, companies that, that really can generate core revenue, regardless of the economy, essential services, uh, work at home related companies, they, they're, they're all doing quite well. The shift to uh, remote work, remote health, remote everything is, is, is certainly quite helpful there. Uh, you know, I think one thing that, 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 that you know, was probably my, my most, you know, meaningful statement, I think, is that, uh, you know, when we did this last time is that I, I, I suggested that COVID was going to uncover holes throughout many different elements of the supply chain and, and industry. And I think that's really been um, the most op eye opening element to me is just how much uh, opportunity has been created, how many holes in the various supply chain, how many elements of, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, opportunity are, 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 are really developing across the space. You know, does another AI company that maybe does a little bit better BI make a difference? Not to us anymore. I mean, you know, does a maybe, you know, third level AI car company make a difference? Just nope. But you know what? A logistics company that's using AI to get products and save money and get it in the door you know, that's great. Did, did, could it be AI or gnomes under the hood? We don't care. It, it's all about what you can deliver today, in our opinion. 
And, you know, our companies, you know, are doing meaningful up rounds. You know, we are not seeing good companies, are, to, to Nuno's point, are getting funded. They are getting funded at a premium today if you're generating revenue, if you're cash flow positive plus. You know, it's the science projects that, that, that I think and, and the nice to haves versus the must haves that are really having a hard time. I'd like to, to compound on that supply chain. So we're in digital media, which has a supply chain. We're just calling it, we invest in digital media value chain technologies, which is distribution. And for us, the uptake has been significant, right? B to C, B to B, B to G, B to government. Uh, and the uptake of digital media distribution, whether it's remote work like Zoom or uh, Netflix movies, it's just been extreme. So in that supply chain of tools or you know, say tools, you say companies, we've seen a lot of uptake in just the scaling, obviously, of users and then the scaling of uh, those supply chain companies that need to grow. So it's been great for us as far as DNA partners. I I would go back to uh, something I introduced when we talked six months ago, which is the notion of three types of markets, right? The, the, the markets that are positively, that are correlated to what's happening in the, the market that is non-correlated. And then within the, posit the, the correlated markets, uh, there is the positively correlated and the negative correlated. I think for the most, the three of us got probably almost all the markets right. We were saying, you know, gaming is going to go through the roof. You know, media entertainment consumption is going to go through the roof. Certainly the digital side, of course, not the physical side. Uh, you know, we, we talked about, um, you know, travel being affected for a long time. I think we've seen that. There was a couple of companies that are doing okay. Uh, but certainly it's a, a space that's been very, very dramatically affected. I'd say two things that maybe uh, we didn't uh, discuss to a lot. I wouldn't say we got it right or wrong, but that we didn't discuss a lot. One, healthcare, and I think maybe F there was probably the most bullish about it. I was probably one of the most skeptical. And I have to say probably F in that sense would have been the one that was right. Um, I think I didn't predict that the withdrawal of regulation would be so significant as we've seen in the US. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened in the veteran, veterinarian services, um, health service in general, telemedicine, a lot of stuff has been abandoned. So I think we're actually having maybe the first, one of the first real interesting digital revolutions around health. I don't think it's going to solve all the problems, but it's the first little tiny digital revolution that's really exciting. Um, I think the second piece that we didn't discuss quite a lot the first time around is the value of brands. And during a crisis, what happens to the value of brands and loyalty? And the interesting thing is actually people become less loyal, right? Because, uh, because there is a table stakes play, which is, do you have digital offerings? Can I buy you? Will you deliver? <laughs> Back to the supply chain point that F was just making. Will you deliver it to me within the next, let's say week, right? No, no longer next day, but let's say the next week or next two weeks. Or will I wait you know, three months to receive my mask or three months to get whatever? And that has shifted dramatically. So in some ways, we now have a market that not only defines digital offerings as table stakes, so it's literally sink or swim. You have no digital offerings as a company. You're just brick and mortar. You are going to die, right? I mean, you are, you, either you're going to die or you're going to face a really difficult time over the next, let's say, year and a half or two years. Or you have digital and you can compete. But we have a shift of loyalties on brands, which is incredible. And I think it's just mind blowing to me what's happening in terms of consumption. And it feels to me a little bit almost like Gen Z, right? We talked about Gen Z in the past and how they have a different set of loyalties around what brands are looking for. We've just had this amped up because of COVID. Uh, you know, people are now focusing on brands that actually have significant and strong digital presence. Uh, I only really look at digital advertising, right? Because that's it, right? Uh, so, so, you know, if you're not advertising to me, if you don't have a proposition that's easy for me to buy from you, for example, if you're in the e-commerce space, I will not buy, right? And, and that I think is quite dramatic. And we're starting to see really big shifts around the world. It's not just in the US of what brands are dominant, right? You know, Coke was the darling and now Coke, well, good luck to Coke, right? Um, because, you know, Coke's, for example, digital strategy around delivery was not there. I mean, they, they, they have a very limited digital strategy. Wow, that's a lot. You know, it's interesting, well, the comments on supply chain, McKinsey just came out with a report last week about how COVID has illustrated all the weaknesses in the supply chain. And just in one of the main points they made was just how interconnected the world is. So something goes wrong in one little space, it just disrupts everything. And sort of on that point, 
you know, a lot of people are, are talking about uh, the impact that the last six months has had specifically in Silicon Valley, where we all are. And I know there was a time when we did these panels and I'd ask investors, I'd say, you know, gee, will you invest in a company that's outside of Silicon Valley? And they'd say, I won't even drive to Stockton. You know, why should I? You know, they're all right here. Uh, so I'm wondering, has, has your investment thesis changed any now that everything's digital and less real world? And I mean, have you expanded your geographic scope? And for our entrepreneurs, is there any more need for them to be here? Yeah. Um, I. I I, I will take this one first because, you know, on this one, I'll, I'll, I'll take the I'm vindicated play, right? I've been talking about multi-geography investments for a very long time, that there's a lot of innovation, a lot of great startups around the world, that one shouldn't just focus in Silicon Valley. Uh, and I think in, if anything happening right now, that's even more clear because people are distributing uh, teams, uh, you know, the cost of living in the Bay Area has become so absurd that we, we have, I think, the beginnings of... Um, a living, uh, a, a leaving flood from SF, right? Um, I'll come back with something positive in a second, but you know, right now it's just people leaving. Um, I was year on year, I think July, the number of vacancies for rentals and sales in SF uh, was 96% up, right? <laughs> year on year. So if people are saying it's not happening, well, it is happening. It's factually happening. Um, uh, there is a good, uh, a good positive afterthought. I'll come back to that. Um, but for us, we feel vindicated. I think there's innovation everywhere. I think the U.S. and the Bay Area is still going to be a huge engine of innovation. <clears throat> but certainly, there's a little bit more distribution of people right now that's happening because of remote work, because of COVID, et cetera. So, so definitely that will happen. Um, presence in the Bay Area and answering that question that you had, I think it still matters. I, I don't see Silicon Valley becoming irrelevant right? Over the next two years, just because people are going away. Big corporations are still here. Uh, some of them have very publicly said that they still believe that the presence, the in-person logic is still important. You know, Reed Hastings from Netflix uh, had a couple of controversially interpreted terms, but, but I think he stood, stood by the notion that people still need to meet. Uh, Facebook is sort of edged with a hybrid model. There, there's a couple of things that now make us believe that even the large corporations that are here are gonna, some of them require that there is some in-person at some point. Uh, and and I, you know, people do have some of their lives around here. They're not just gonna pick up all of their stuff. Maybe they're gonna go away for a year and they come back. So I don't feel that, I think the Silicon Valley thing that's happening right now, which is actually dramatic with a lot of people leaving, is uh, a point in time and it will change, okay? And uh, you know, uh, Joe probably in FF much better experience because I wasn't here in the nuclear, the great nuclear winter of 2001, 2003. So they'll probably have amazing stories to share with us, but the tourists left. And back then, from what I understand, the tourists left as well. And so the people that stuck with it are the people that are committed to being here, that are committed to this ecosystem. And I think what we're gonna see is a renewal of Silicon Valley. And maybe it's two years down the road, maybe it's three years down the road, and, and renewal of San Francisco, which I'm personally very looking, very much looking forward to. I think San Francisco is a, a city with an amazing history that in some ways in, was, was a little bit lost in their, in their notion of what does it stand for. And, and it was a bit of a violent, um, it was violently aggressed by, by people that were making way too much money uh, and had no interest in the city except the utility of having great meals and going out and whatever. And I think we're going to have a better, potentially a better San Francisco after this cycle. So it's a rough cycle. It's a rough cycle that's going to take, in my opinion, a few years. But I think Silicon Valley will maintain its importance. And we're going to have a renewal of San Francisco, which I'm very much looking forward to. Go ahead, yeah, I just want to piggyback on that. Uh, as far as context again, you know, I've been here since 96. I'm not drinking any Silicon Valley Kool-Aid. If you watch me on stage in China or other countries, you know, I'm, I'm about speaking about the culture and how of Silicon Valley and wh how it works. But I also discredit Silicon Valley for like its business models and its uh, uptake on apps. You know, apps are going to, you know, serve the world. And, but to be, to be specific, you know, we did that in, in 2001, we had a big exodus, 2002, you know, that was a big dot com exodus. And then in 2009, you know, that was more of a real estate exodus, you know, more about the macro elements around real estate, but the Bay Area hung in there on its real estate valuations, basically from across the nation, relativity, relatively. And then I think the, if we go to present tense and uh, pandemic uh, crisis, 
I feel like, yeah, there is a, a minor exodus, but it's really that millennial generation that came in 10 years ago with the Apple App Store, I'm going to be a billionaire and code on iOS and Android. Oops, it didn't work. I didn't make a billion dollars. I've been hanging out for years after that, just working for any tech company that I can. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm just going to go back to where I came from. It's a theme. What I think is, you know, in conclusion of this one notion is I think it'll create more transparency for human capital to really rise. They, so the intellect of human capital will really rise and for the accountability of politicians. So obviously I live in San Francisco County and I, felt, I feel like politicians have been waning on accountability for 10 or more years. So it, it's gonna, they're gonna have to be able to figure out how to draw people to the Bay Area. It can't just be the shiny, shiny rock of, oh, Silicon Valley is so great because we're innovators or inventors. It's gonna have to, it's gonna have to be economics invention and intellectuals that are still here and then accountability for everyone to work together the beauty of the ecosystem of universities banks law firms large companies all associations all trying to work with the startup company so that better sustain otherwise we have a trigger point i i, I would add one thing to to what joe just said i'm going to pick up on one thing just one one quick sentence on talent, I think what he just said is essential, which is the quality of talent in Silicon Valley in some ways. I always used to say that on average, median and top end, probably some of the best people in the world, best talent in the world is here, but the variance is huge. The variance is huge. You still have a lot of crappy talent here. And you know, I, I think what he just said is very, very powerful, which is maybe now we'll get a little bit less variance, right? Because the people that will stick around are people that have the right to be here, right? That have immense talent. It's not just you know, filling in seats on a bus, right? Um, so so I, I think that actually, actually that point he made is actually very, very profound, very, very important. Yeah, yeah well, it's so quiet. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I'm enjoying listening to my colleagues. I mean, I, you know, look, we, we've been investing outside of the Valley for a long time. Uh, you know, there are companies that need to be here. There are companies that don't need to be here. There's talent in a lot of different places. And I think what we're seeing is, um, you know, the, 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 it, it depends on the stage of the company, uh, what the company is doing and where it needs to be. But the critical infrastructure, whether that's capital, uh, you know, academics, uh, legal, uh, you know, even, even to a large degree, some of the finance elements, they're all still here. They're going to remain here. To Nuno's point, I think, you know, and this goes back to my statement, nice to have versus must have kind of thing. There's talent in the Valley that is must have. There's talent in the Valley that's nice to have. You know, nice to have. The companies can shed. They can pull that back in in, in a few years. Must have is must have. There are core engineers out there that, you know, they must be there. Uh, you know, I just ran into someone that was being recruited by Apple from Southern California. They're, you know, busting down all the doors and paying all the bills to get this person up into the valley. And they don't even know when he'll be, you know, needed in the office, right? So I, I you know, I think, you know, if anything, what this is doing is surfacing talent in a broader way. I think companies are determining where the talent needs to land. And, you know, what elements of the business need to be in-house versus virtual, et cetera, right? So I think the, the jury's still out. Let's see how, this, how long this lasts. But, you know, if VCs aren't thinking beyond the Valley at this point, I, th I think it's pretty challenging. Well said. Yeah. Anything to add, Joe, to that? No, just well said. I mean, we've been looking at USA, China, and now Philippines. I mean, that's been since 2019, pre-COVID. So. You got to get outside the valley. You can lean on the valley, but you got to get outside the valley. Yeah. So, so to, to follow up on that. So I was here in two, 2001 and this reminds me a lot of 2001 and that the traffic is so much better. <laughs> it's what I think of when I think of those days. Um, the difference is uh, back then we didn't have anything to do and now we're still very busy. Um, well, the only one going into the office, Roger, we don't actually know the traffic's bad because none of us actually go. You're like an essential worker or something that, <laughs> that, 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 that can go into the office. You know, I, I can't, you know, I can't tell you, I, you know, I, I, you know, our <laughs> office is in an 18 story black office building and, you know, there's no chance we're going back into the office for anything other than, you know, a masked and glove mail run. You know, we actually have, we actually have like a secure mail site off site right now for things to arrive. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it, it can be, 
it can be dependent on that. Well, on that point, um, I'd like to ask what you're seeing in deal flow and whether um, the fact that you won't go to the office has affected uh, your ability to meet new entrepreneurs, talk to new companies, make new investments. I mean, that's on everybody's mind. I hear that a lot. Say, gee, do you think they'll invest in me if we just do this all virtually? Uh, I, I think Joe mentioned earlier that he was getting less correspondence, um, if, I, if I got that right. Yep. For some for some strange reason, I'm getting more. Um, I don't know yeah. if people got my email somehow <laughs> along the way, <laughs> but, oh, but yeah. it's but it's I'm I'm, yeah, I'm getting I'm, I'm getting a little bit more um, top of funnel. Uh, oh, I think in yeah, general, yeah. getting a little bit more top of funnel. We're I think five I, x. We're five x top of funnel. We're, yeah, which top, is not helpful actually because you know nice. about about eighty five percent of top of funnel. You know, probably should never have entered the funnel. You know. The, the, the cool thing is exactly that, F, which is, you know, people are sharing teasers, they're sharing paragraphs. And right now, because I'm seeing more top of funnel, I'm asking people, can you send me a pitch deck, right? Because I, I'm, it doesn't make sense for me to take a first call um, unless there's something exciting there. And so it allows you to see a lot more companies without necessarily taking a lot of your time. Uh, and I think, you know, our associates, principal, uh, the rest of the partners have been experiencing something similar. Uh, in terms of the UFO, so there's certainly a lot more. It's more uh, geographically distributed. I mean, to that point, we always were multi-geo since we started Strive Capital. Um, we, uh, you know, our first fund, we've had three amazing successes. Uh, and, you know, basically out of those, only one is a U.S. company or a Bay Area company. Uh, a second one of them was a a company from China that has since become, did a flip uh, to be a Delaware C Corp, but to be honest, they were originally Chinese. Uh, and, and the third one was a company in Japan. So it's like, you know, uh, we, we've always believed that, you know, money and returns on investment and great companies are elsewhere. Um, we, I, I would say, you know, people are getting really crafty on how they get stuff to us. <laughs> so like from really smart LinkedIn requests to, uh, to, to finding email addresses to, you know, getting warm interest from whoever they can, like semi-warm interest. So I, I do think that this, this element of being more distributed, remote working, uh, everyone's sort of getting used to it. And in that sense, we're getting a little bit more productive at processing deals if we can take a look at the pitch deck in advance, et cetera, so we can make calls faster. Um, I personally, am, I'm, I've seen more deals uh, throughout, uh, for everywhere from, from top of funnel to due diligence to deal making. I think we've been processing a lot more stuff. How about you other guys, Joe? You said you're getting less correspondence, huh? Less correspondence because we've always been, like we're, none of us are on LinkedIn. We don't have a website. We really only correspond via email. We got most of our deal flow from uh, our colleagues. We always want it this way from our colleagues and from panels when we're, you know. You need to transform to being digital first. Come on. <laughs> I don't need to. Uh, do, I, do we want to? No. Um, but I will say that we've, we've had more quality incoming, whether, however we get it, you know, and, and, and outside of China and the Philippines, like the UK, um, we are looking at a comp we'll look at it and we're, we're impressed. And then in Japan, one that we're very impressed with, very impressed with, but, uh, um, it's not like we're going to pull the trigger and go outside of our bubble necessarily just because it's, litigious uh, extensively, but um, we, and we tell them this, we're very transparent about it, but um, I'm okay with having less correspondence and giving more time to our portfolio companies as well. So that means more email to mobile network operators and big internet companies, as far as they're the big buyers um, of our company's product sets. So it's a, it's a nice balance. Yep, anything to add? Yeah, well, you know, look, I mean, we're getting a ton of deal flow. I, 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 I echo Nuno. I mean, people are getting super creative. I, I respect a really creative entrepreneur. I mean, I've got people like, you know, slingshotting off like multiple second party LinkedIn contacts through someone that I met in high school. You know, I, you know to, to Joe's point, I'm actually not even on Facebook anymore because the deal flow there is scary. Um, you know, 
LinkedIn, you know, you just kind of, you know, I mean, look, uh, I would say my my inbox at LinkedIn is 10x what it was before. I probably only got through 20% of it before, and that means I get through like 2% of it now. We get a ton of deal flow. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I mean, I think the overarching issue really for us is to a large degree, we've kind of come to the closure. We're probably not going to spend a lot of in-person breathing in the same room time with an entrepreneur. Um, you know, there is something about that that I think we all kind of have this gut feel around. So we do rely way more on our colleagues, right? And I think to Nuno's, Nuno's point is that we had, you know, we're, we're probably less on the earlier stage unless they're proven entrepreneurs that, that we can really get that, that collegial sort of, you know, thumbs up from. Service providers like you, Roger, you know, we're always, we always looked at stuff from you. We're always looking stuff from you. Some mm -hmm. of you guys have lost your filters, I think, but you know, you always are really good at not sending garbage. But yeah, I mean, I think it's really important, you know, when you're, you know, when your banker is sending your deal flow, your neighbor's sending your deal flow, you get a little worried. So, you know, I think for us, it's it's just trying to figure out, you know, where to spend the time. I agree with you now. You know, we'll we'll be able to burn through like a you know 10, 15 page deck pretty quick. Um, you know, I will say you gotta send us a deck you know, send us a, a, a detailed bullet point email there. If we don't get back to you, we're not interested. You know, don't wait for some kind of like, thank you, but you know, you did not get the award from us, you know, uh, and then just kind of move on, which is important. So I want to remind the audience, <clears throat> the, the attendees, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We're going to get to your questions in about 15 minutes. Um, so go ahead and type them there. I'll gather them all up. Don't use the, the chat box for questions. Um, so kind of on that point, uh, I guess following up a little bit more, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the future uh, <clears throat> because it's every bit as uncertain, I think, as it was six months ago. We're in the middle of a brutal election season, um, you know, and, and how that turns out, which is anybody's guess, could could certainly impact things. We don't know if this COVID is going to go away or if it's going to come back. Um, there's just a lot of it. We don't have, we haven't even talked about civil unrest yet. Um, I'm just curious as to how that is impacting your investment decisions, your ability to raise new funds, um, your desire to hold some dry powder, if at all. I mean, can, can you talk about that? about the future a little bit. Anybody want to ask? The macro stuff thus far hasn't really uh, had a, any impact um, uh, on anything I'm doing, fundraising, investing um, in that sense, or in the companies that macro stuff that you mentioned, right? Obviously COVID is, right? Just to be clear, we're separating COVID from the other macro stuff, uh, elections, uh, you know, um, safety, et cetera. So, so the other macro stuff, the elections, the safety piece, uh, social justice, et cetera, I don't think has really impacted um, significantly any of my activities. I think if anything, it's given rise to some interesting conversations and discussions at board level with a few of my portfolio companies around what they're doing about it and where do they stand. Uh, but again, I, I wouldn't say there's been a tremendous impact, certainly from my activity. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, go for it, Joe. Um, I guess I, I'm not guess. I have to not guess on uh, our impact of what Washington D.C. does in respect to. Uh, I'll just generalize Asia, um, and uh, looking at how commerce is portrayed and the accuracy of collecting tariffs and taxes, the accuracy of portraying that to the United States citizens, that those international relations do affect us at DNA Partners. The, the citizens of the United States and swinging the pendulum so hard, whether it's the press or the citizens out in the streets, I think affects the psyches of every citizen in our nation and it's really disenchanting and disheartening for me. And so it makes us at DNA Partners filter a little bit more of the psychology of a team that we invest in, because we always say of three categories, we invest in people, product, and marketplace, marketplace being geography and timing, people, product, and marketplace. And we're investing in the people, number one. So we wanna understand, are they 
a hard pendulum swinger of the cancel culture um, or not, or where do they stand with issues in their professional life and maybe a little bit in their personal life? Not that we're digging into the personal life, but you know who who the board of directors are at present tense or their executive team reflects their future thinking. So yes, it affects us um, in looking at the psyche of the people that we would be investing in. Interesting, you know, wow. because- um, I'm just gonna take a step back, Joe. You just hang out there in the breeze by yourself, my friend. No, no, no. You in on none of these things. No, 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 no. <laughs> I know you, I think you've always been investing in product and then people, and I think then. Oh no! Look, I, I love the thesis. I'm you know in anything further than that, I I I have no idea what you said. I was never here. I don't even know. <laughs> that. Well, I want to drill down a little bit because I, a little bit different aspect of that because I heard somebody say at the start of the presentation that you know technology is important. Everything is technology, and I wanted to circle back to that, or at least that's what the prediction was six months ago. Uh, how important is it <clears throat> is the people element of this, especially now that the valley, the demographics are changing and, and are people still number one uh, in terms of, of when you make an investment decision? You know, I, I, I tend to, you know, I mean, I, I see a lot of startups too, and that's kind of the first thing I look at is who's the team, you know, and then whether they've got some industry expertise and then maybe the technology. Are all those fundamentals still the same? Does that all still hold? And have I got it right, by the way? Well, I stated, I'll be quick, I stated already that people, product, marketplace, marketplace being geography and timing. Yeah, it's always, pe I mean, I think it's always people first. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, especially in the earlier stages, I mean, even the tech is, is, is so entwined with the individuals. I mean, if you build, you know, great teams do well in down markets, right? Uh, you know, subpar teams, you know, basic teams do not make it through tough times like this, right? So I think that's a big part of it. You know, teams that were, you know, were not sensitive to the, the political landscape or the emotional landscape of their employees have not done well in this crisis. The people that, you know, knew how to listen and, you know, and you could see it, you know, entrepreneurs that know how to listen, know how to parse the data, know how to be, you know, oftentimes just good human beings to start are you know are carrying the day right now uh I've, I've always been a little bit contrary on this i i love people i you get into deals or not into deals because of people because of the relationship we have with someone some companies are usually successful just because of the grit and resilience of the founders or the ceo or whoever is involved so I, i'm not diminishing the importance of people and i'm not diminishing the importance of us analyzing them but we, we spend a huge amount of time around market. I, I think to, to uh, Joe's point, market is a very broad thing. So market is competitive landscape, uh, market growth, adjacencies, uh, timing, and a few other elements that happen in it. Um, we still spend a ton of time with people, understanding if they can fundraise. Can they fundraise the next one or two rounds or not? Do they have the grit? Do they have any signs of grit and resilience in their background? Do they stick to things? Are they able to withstand pain, right? As Ben Arwitz used to uh, mentioned in his book, right? The hard thing about hard things, right? He, he talks about this notion of pain, right? Um, so all of that matters a lot. At the end of the day, we're, we're looking for all these elements. So product, tech, stack, uh, market, team. We don't second guess markets. Um, so uh, I have I don't I don't have an example of a bad market where an amazing entrepreneur won in. Uh, certainly from a venture investable perspective, maybe some of my colleagues here do. Uh, so normally I don't bet in markets that I believe by nature are niche um, uh, or don't fit well into our thesis. And I spend a lot of we spend a lot of time around product market fit. So we we spend a lot of time trying to find um, what I call cheat sheets for product market fit, trying to figure out if there's angles there that really highly de-risk product market fit for us. And that's been one of our claims to fame as a quant fund. So we spend a huge amount of time on that. Um, so again, not to diminish people, it's super essential. It's one of the few parts that I don't think will ever be replaced by a computer. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of the interpretation of people and how we work. So it's, it's, it's part of why we get a job as human beings. Um, but but in, in the end, uh, I think uh, certainly in early stage, 
there needs to be a little bit, uh, or there should be a little bit more discipline around market analysis and, and figuring out if there's any de-risk in your product market fair or not, uh, which I don't see in a lot of the industry. Um, I'm, I'm probably overgeneralizing, but I don't see it over a lot of the industry. I'm not hear a lot, hearing a lot of people talk about the importance of the technology itself. Um, I'm hearing product market fit and team, et cetera. So for the, for the attendees, just, you know, keep, keep that in mind. Uh, your VCs are not saying if you have a better mouse trap, you're gonna, the world will be the path to your door. It's, it's not that, it's, it's a bit of a, I mean, as you know better than anyone, Roger, it's a bit of a, um, a defensive mechanism, it's an edging mechanism, right? If you have really truly unique IP and technology, it, that has value, right? You know, so you add to your value pool, right? Where you have a team that has value that could be acquired. hired You potentially will build a product that might have value and you potentially could build a business that's valuable. Just having tech and IP that's valuable, it just adds to that. It's sort of part of the menu. I now have another item that has value. And so that constitutes an interesting edge for some investors. And, and I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong about it. So the, having IP and having core tech is nothing wrong about it. It's not the sole thing. And I think maybe around the table, you have people that invest a lot around products rather than on you know, very hardcore deep tech. Uh, maybe Joe being a little bit the, the, um, the one out uh, on that. Uh, but but I, I, I suspect that's sort of the the element here where IP by itself is probably not super valuable, right? It's just an edge. So it, it does um, mitigate some of the down, downside and, and risk. I like and, the way and, and the great, great, you know, the, in fact, you know, I, I was having a virtual connect with, a, with, a, a, with another colleague in the venture space. And, you know, he, he, he used the term, the valley is littered with the carcasses of the best technology out there. So the best tech d very rarely wins. And, you know, it's a combination, you know, to Joe's point and Nuna's point of market, team, tech, being in the right place at the right time, having the right group of, uh, you know, investors and cohort behind you. So, you know, there are a lot of factors that, that equal success, uh, you know, as part of that. And I, I see we're getting a lot of great questions coming in the Q&A side. And, you know, I, I think we're catching most of that stuff. But, but, you know, these are good points. I mean, I think you know, you've got to look at relevancy right now. And I think to us, you know, it's not as much, you know, just at, at a high level looking at the size of market, it's the ability to penetrate in a meaningful time. I think, you know, we are seeing a lot of the smaller venture funds, even, even some of the larger ones really having a hard time, you know, raising additional LP capital. Uh, I think there, there was a lapse in the exit time horizons that, you know, that VCs, historically were held to that are that is really becoming an issue uh you know companies that you know were from the you know uh the last 10 years that still haven't exited that's really hard to raise another round on um you know earlier funds that, that you know are five years in are not getting any liquidity with their companies and therefore are having a hard time now the good side is we're moving into another mass m a cycle right now you know, mm -hmm. the big, the big, big tech companies have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They have a lot of public market equity to throw around. Uh, you know, Apple is, I mean, I, I've heard, you know, that literally they are on a almost a buy it one company per day kind of clip, definitely at one buy one per week kind of clip. I mean, we are hearing, you know, anything that is, you know, that they, they, they can really give a little edge to one of the big players is other than Amazon, of course, which just is a predator. Uh, is getting bought out there. So that is something that's super interesting. The telecom, the telcos are buying again. So Joe, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're busy with that stuff as well. Right. Yeah. Are Except you for, seeing a lot of exits right now? We're, yeah, we're, we're getting more approaches. That's for sure. We are. So it's great. And I, yeah, I wanted to highlight that. It's like right on F, you're right on. And that's for USA and China. And I would say China's uh, more aggressive in beating down the startup on valuation and uh, stating like, you better do this or dot, dot, dot. And that's a pretty heavy statement. Uh, so yeah, M&A is up and it's good for all of us early investors. Yeah, I mean, you're the last guy that's still doing business. I mean, you know, other than vacation, I don't think any of us are going back I mean, at least in my cohort of VCs, I mean, I think, you know, we've seen a lot of, of Chinese LPs attempt to get their money out. This, they, they did not behave well at an LP level. 
Um, they're not going to be welcome back. It, it is no longer size of, of cash. I think what is most interesting to us right now is what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, that is probably the most interesting thing that we see going on right now. This massive, epic amount of capital just got exposed to the largest startup ecosystem outside of the valley. And we are just waiting to see that explode. Um, you know, that is very, very interesting. The world's largest sovereign funds that could not find a deal. I remember sitting at, you know, at a dinner in Dubai at one point and, and you know, the, the, the sovereign fund wealth manager was sitting there saying, gosh, we can't find any deal flow. And I remember thinking to myself that 500 miles west, there's more deals than you guys could ever process. And, and I, I think I said that, and I remember he said, well, you know, we can't do that. Well, the gloves are off. And, you know, the, this is going to be a very interesting dynamic that, you know, Gulf capital can flow directly to Israel versus the Israelis feeling they need to come to the Valley to get the big capital. And that's, that is a major shift that, that is going to impact the Valley in terms more so than anything else, in my opinion, that we've spoken about so far today. Wow. But, well, it's a really, really interesting analysis. Yeah. Before we go to q and I just want to highlight uh, a macro notion of the change about how top down, whether we, you know, government to startup and, and startup to government, when you're, when you're building your startup company, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, Facebook was not thinking about regulatory issues at all. And that's very transparent and they're still difficult. They have difficulty with creating any type of policy within their company. They love it to be elastic, right? So I just want all the entrepreneurs to make a mental notice that, a mental note that, you know, the US has been typically been, oh, we'll create invention and innovation down here and it'll percolate up towards the government initiatives or towards regulation. Let's not consider regulation at all or, or very minimal priority. And then if you go to other countries um, like Korea or China or you know European countries where or Germany, where it's top down, you go to the regulators first and you consider that how is that going to work and how is it going to be deployed in the Regulators going to work with the large corporations and then trickle down to the startups. Um, so when you're a startup, please make a mental note. I think with COVID, you kind of have startups looking, there's finding balance between international companies thinking this way top down and USA companies thinking, oh, I better start thinking about regulators more. So it's starting to have the, a balance between we better be considering who, what, where, when, why, and how. Okay. Well, before we go to questions, uh, I want to ask, uh, how does everyone find you folks if they want to follow up with you? I'm going to put my LinkedIn profile uh, on the chat. Uh, Just but, very uh, simply uh, go to LinkedIn and um, put in the notes that we met through this event. Um, and if you're really, really smart, you will listen to my podcast, which I will put in a second and say something smart about it. Smart. Yeah. Which I do with, uh, by the way, with Bertrand Schmidt, who's the co-founder of App Andy. So we do it together. So it's not just my work. Cool. I'll look it up. Yeah. Link, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is always the best. Don't feel bad if I didn't get back to you. That means I'm not wasting your time. So how's that? <laughs> I chose to take myself off of LinkedIn in 2009. I'm thinking about going back on as a case study because now that Microsoft owns them and there's a new CEO as of June 10th. So maybe I can stand behind them and get more product development. Uh, but how to reach me through Rob or Roger um, is the ideal way. Or if you internet search my name, uh, Joe, Jason, J-A-S-I-N-I-N. -I -N. Um, I'll definitely reach, reach out to you, but please uh, put in the subject heading when you email me uh, that idea to IPO um, uh, topic, please. And once again, we're software, infrastructure, digital media, value chain technologies. Yeah, and, and I'll echo what Joe said as well. I mean, you know, really going through a trusted provider is, is the best way to get to us. Look, I, you know, it, when Roger sends something to us, when Rob sends something to us, 
you know, we are expecting them to have filtered that to a degree. They're not sending us garbage, so we'll read it. They're also our friends as much as our colleagues. So, you know, you, you try not to let down a friend, even if you got to stretch a little. So that is really important to us. Uh, you know, if it requires you to sign Roger up, you know, go sign him up. You know, I mean, that's how you're going to get to us. I just want to note, I have been thinking about this a lot during COVID is digital business card. And so if anyone's interested in a digital business card type discussion, contact me because this is so important where we, we should be able to just press a button and, and uh, press a click and click on be able to share our contact information. So this is ludicrous that we don't have this. Okay. Well, I got to get the questions or Rob's going to yell at me. So first we got a lot of good questions here. Uh, here's uh, the first one uh, the the person who asked this is gone, but I want to get to it anyway, because it raises kind of a good point. It's how can startup tech nonprofits look for funding? So I don't know if there is such a thing as a nonprofit tech startup, but you know, I've been seeing a lot more, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll let you get to that. I've been seeing a lot more social, no, no. Yeah. social benefit companies um, uh, or benefit companies or things like that. Do you guys do any, any social impact investing? So, so I think B Corps and double bottom line companies, et cetera, uh, definitely are getting capital. So, and there's more and more impact funds coming out. Um, and definitely even some institutional venture firms that are looking more and more into the, that space. If I, if I saw the question correctly, this was more of a classic nonprofit, so not a, not a, a B Corp. And so answering that question specifically, I think that's a little bit trickier because uh, obviously we are for-profit organizations. We have investors that give us money uh, in many different fashions, but classically into a fund structure. And so from that fund structure, we take ourselves something called management fees to pay for salaries, offices, et cetera. And we get hopefully part of the upside, which is uh, what we call carried interest. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to invest in things that don't get any return to us, right? Uh, for obvious reasons, because the whole business is based on people getting money to us so that they get amazing returns and we also get part of that upside. Um, so there I would focus. I've been on the board of a couple of nonprofits. I actually, before this call, I was almost late for this call. I was, I was in the midst of a, of a discussion with a, with a nonprofit that I'm, I'm super excited about. And um, I mean, there the sources are different. It's, you know, foundations, uh, government grants, uh, I net worth individuals as well, family offices, which are similar to us as funds. Um, but people that are really more focused on what impact would you have that is not necessarily financial return to them as individuals or as a fund or as a financial investor, right? So it's a very different animal. Um, I personally uh, don't invest in that space. Uh, as an investor, I do obviously uh, donate money and donate my time to, to nonprofits. Um, one last note, I would say there's actually some of my best ever uh, investments, certainly that started as an angel. I have been companies that have both focused on generating amazing returns and are changing the world. So it's not impossible to invest in companies that have significant impact from a society perspective, from, um, from an environment perspective, from uh, a health perspective, et cetera, that also are great returns on investment. Um, so that's the only thing I would say. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo that. I mean, having been, you know, plant-based protein investors, uh, you know, really, you know, focusing in areas where we can kind of blend what I like jokingly call altruism with our greed is super important. But to Nino, Nino's point is that at the end of the day, you know, we, we have a day job and that's to return capital to our investors. As it, as it applies to this, I mean, from a nonprofit, this is a great time uh, as a nonprofit. I mean, you know, sadly what has happened is there's been this great disparity of wealth in this country. So there's significant wealth at the top of the food chain. You know, bankers, uh, impact funds, family offices are all looking for interesting nonprofits. If you could show greater efficiency through technology, uh, greater return on their investment, because although they don't look for a cash investment, they're looking for some other, you know, metric to follow. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. The, the last part of that question, supporting fund op funding uh, opportunities for female entrepreneurs, there are a ton. This is the greatest time in the history of venture 
uh, to, to have the support system that female entrepreneurs do. Uh, you know, and, and there are tons of organizations out there in the Valley, tons on the national level, Astria, she CEO, et cetera, et cetera, that are incredibly supportive of that. Um, and please, you know, get on the internet, spend the time and you will find those folks. I think uh, this, this has been a good, this, good question for me uh, to really, to think about it in real time, iterate in my head in real time uh, while the, the two other panelists were answering. I was thinking, oh, Tom's, Tom's shoe business model is pretty great. I mean, we're, I'm talking about philanthropy in that way. And then DNA Partners, we are you know, in the intangible goods world. Um, so maybe someone creates a song and they get com commerce for getting the song or the video or the TV show. Um, and then they give one song away. I think that's interesting. So we're always looking for new business models at DNA Partners in digital media. Um, so I think it's pretty, pretty interesting idea if there can be a hybrid. Okay. Um, next question. What factors are you looking for in a company or idea in the near future, say one year before you invest in it? I know we kind of covered that in the last year, but anything you want to focus on or dial in on? Well, I, I still, I'm a, I've been a diehard of AR VR. Um, and I really feel like, and had nothing to do with all the rumors or whatever Apple's doing. I don't care what Apple does. I never did. Everyone on the panel knows that about me. Uh, but I just think that there's, since Consumer Electronics Show 2020, it's just, we've come a long way in that seven, eight, not nine months, nine months, uh, that the international landscape for AR, VR, and we're talking about, let's just talk about glasses versus goggles. Um, the iterations have come a long way since then. So I think it's pretty exciting. Interesting. Is this a, sorry, this is the question around uh, the factors we're looking for. Uh, is that the Yeah, question? what factors are you looking for in a company or our ID in the near future before you invest? Um, we don't invest, we very rarely invest that early, I would say. I, would, I wouldn't say we never invest, but very, very rarely we invest at an idea stage. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, you need to show something, at least an MVP, something that's working. And ideally, if it's in consumer, some beta test information, closed beta, maybe public beta would be better. Um, so, so we're looking for some type of product development, technology development, team formation, and actual traction, early numbers that we could take a look at, even if it's just, again, a beta. Um, the bar, I think, has gone higher because, again, the cost, in particular in software, I think in physical tech, things are slightly different. But in, in software, the costs of developing um, some of these platforms have gone down so dramatically that, you know, we would expect you to have raised a little bit of money from friends and family or angel investors or whoever's coming before us as institutional investors. So there's a little bit of that lag that, that, uh, that you'd need to fit. Um, so just idea, very, very uncommon, very uncommon that we would invest in. I can't recall the last time we did. Okay. Yeah, so in a, in all, echo all of that, and we're, we're even further downstream from Nuno in regard to that. I mean, the number one thing that we're gonna look for is customer feedback, whether it's paid or beta, you know, I, you know, you can tell me all day long how important your product or service or software is to the world. And unless, you know, you bring me three customers that are willing to write a check, even if in its nascent form for it, we're going to be hard pressed to, to really buy into that, regardless of the market size, regardless about what we think. To us, this is all about, can you get sales traction for, the, is this a must have in this current economy? Okay, we got a question about India, um, especially given what's going on in the supply chain. Would any of you guys ever invest in India? Um, yes, but from my end, I've invested in China, uh, Chinese companies, uh, Japanese, um, uh, Southeast Asian, etc. cetera. Um, India, yes, but I think it's one of those markets where I absolutely would want to go with a strong co-investor that can really help with the due diligence on the ground. 
um, and, and again, I'm not trying to make this comment as a sort of a biased comment. It's just my experience in doing business uh, in Asia Pacific over the years has shown me that there's a lot of intricacies to the business in India that if you don't have feet on the ground, if you don't understand, it's even difficult, for example, to do some background checks on people, et cetera. So, um, so I felt that over the years, uh, and, and just to be clear, my bar on China has gone to the same level. You know, if there was no feet on the ground to, to help me, I, I would probably not do the investment. Um, so, so, so very similar for India, but I would definitely invest in India. And for, for us, or even me, it, it is a, a curiosity. And uh, I, I was at the GSMA Mobile World Congress Shanghai in June 2019. And I met some very interesting Indian companies there. And then obviously we see Google and Facebook making billions of dollars investments in 2020. Um, I, I would just like to throw a caveat out there. If we were to look at it, it would probably have to be on the foundation of Kai OS, uh, the feature phone slash mini smartphone operating system that is the second uh, largest OS in India. So it goes Android, Kai OS, and iOS third. Okay, I don't know if anybody here invests in semiconductors or systems, but uh, the question oh, is, uh, proof of concept is expensive. I mean, more generally, I mean, you see that in other industries as well. How do you yeah. solve that dilemma when it takes a lot of money just to, just to prove the concept? Uh, I, I've looked actively at it uh, in, in the big gold rush of bit mining. <laughs> I went back to looking at it. Um, I, I have not invested um, in it. Um, in a long, long time, but I've looked quite heavily at it. I think it is also true of, as we were talking about before, physical tech companies and hard tech companies that, you know, the first stages of development are more costly. They need to be done also in a different process. It's more waterfall rather than agile. So in some ways, there's obviously a cost relating to that to get something done, prototypes, uh, first releases, to, to early customers, et cetera. So, so I, 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 would, I would position that... Um, as there's a, there's a slight delay in everything we're saying. So, so in some ways, what I was saying before, the bar for investing in software is here for me. And I'm normally, I'd say, pre-seed to seed investor, depending on where we're talking about. You know, the bar is one step further. So a company that's at Series A probably will have launched, but won't have a huge amount of traction yet. Whereas a company in the software business at Series A will have to have some clear signs of product market fit. Right, so, so there's a little bit of a delay between stages of investing and that's the expectations we would have. I would still expect you as a founder to be super efficient about the capital you're given. So it's not like, okay, I'm gonna do a semicon company, my first round needs to be $5 million. I, unless you're a superstar and you've done it before, super successful entrepreneur, et cetera, it's very unlikely that you to get uh, to raise $5 million up front. So you'll need to start more or less with the same money that any other industry would need to start with and your milestones are obviously one step behind, right? So you're, you're not getting to the same level as a mobile app developer would get in terms of development of their product, MVP, et cetera. So that's how I would look at it. It's still, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that you'd raise in your first stage. You need to figure out what would be the milestones for that and have a clear anchoring that allows you to go to the next stage and then raise some more money either from other angels, micro VC funds, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I would really, you know, even even take a step back from that and say, look, there, there are incubators now globally that are focused in the semi space. Uh, they know a lot of that. There's a lot of pooled resources there. They can help you get to those critical MVP points that, that Nuno's talking about. There is a bit of a renewed interest in semiconductors, but it, but it's a very thin uh, it's a very thin category in, and you need to have a lot of, you know, proven winners on your team, advisors, board members that, that can help, you know, I think validate that, that, that this is a big span that, that, that's going to be successful. I'm overall, I'm excited that uh, that question came in. I, I think it's great. Let's keep it, let's keep it going. Let's keep up the invention in semiconductors. I think a specific vertical of interest, just the huge generalization is movie studio quality camera, um, where you're working with chipsets with those types of uh, consumer electronic manufacturers, the high end, very, very high end subsector. 
And then for DNA partners, um, this is just a one-off. I think that we would be interested in investing in an eSIM solution set. Obviously, that's not a semiconductor, but anyone out there, eSIM. Okay, um, I like this question. Here's somebody who wants to know if he should have a co-founder. How important is that? And in particular, how important is it to have a technical co-founder? Well, I, you know, we, we almost always need to see a co-founder or at least some element of management team. I think it speaks to a lot of issues. One, does that person work with others well? We are always suspect of the single co-founder. Number two, what if that person gets hit by a bus tomorrow? What happens to our money? So, you know, there has to be, you know, succession plans. There has to be a broader factor. You know, we like to see, you know, three minds are better than one, right? Founders that say, look, I can do it ourselves, probably have bigger issues, uh, you know? And so we, we, we always like to see it. I mean, we, you know, uh, and, we, and we really don't work at idea stage where we're going to roll up our sleeves and help people, you know, get them those. So please don't send us email. Can you help me find a co-founder? Because that's just not what we do. That's your, that's your, that's your role, right? Um, so so I, I, I won't... Um, you know, what F said is spot on, right? So all the risks. So single co-founder, you need to understand, single founder is obviously riskier than two or three co-founders um, around the table uh, for the reasons that F just, um, just named. How can you, would I still invest in a single co-founder? Potentially, yes. How would I de-risk it? I would de-risk it exactly with what F said at the beginning of his statement, which is you complement it with your management team. So maybe the people around you are not the co-founders formally, but they are around you. Now, if it's a really small team and the people around you are, they're pretty early and they're probably not getting paid much and they have great upside and you consider them truly your, you know, your, your right arms and your, you know, left arms, et cetera. Maybe they should be co-founders. <laughs> Even if it's post hoc, they were not there at the moment of founding. Yeah. And, and we've seen that in the past. Uh, so that's another thing. It's, it's not a hack. I mean, a co-founder dynamic, it's a pretty important dynamic. We've seen, if we start having like three co-founders or more, the, the likelihood at the end that one of them or more drops out is pretty high uh, from the company. So, so again, if you have like five co-founders, that's weird. Um, like why? Um, you know, not impossible. So any, anything that looks a bit odd to us is sort of a manifestation of risk. You need to complement it with your, with, your, with your management team. You need to show us, okay, I don't have another co-founder just because of how this happened and panned out but here's the rest of my team, right? And they're fully committed and they're highly capable to get us to the next two or three years of, of growth. I, I think what the two guys said before this is great and I don't disagree with anything, but I wanna be a contrarian. I mean, co-founders did not work out well for Zuckerberg. I mean, this just drives his own entity pretty much from the outside looking in. in that well, perspective. But, but, but well, 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 but to, 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 to Nuno's point, they hired in some very high level people that are still surrounding Zuck early on. I mean, Boz was there from the beginning. I mean, no offense, man. I mean, you know, it, you know, that, you know, it, as you, as we all know, you know, Elon Musk, Zuck, not a lot of co-founders floating around, but at the end of the day, you know, to, to Nuno's point, a lot of the people that are around him, you know, to a large degree are can, kind of considered, uh, co-founders. There was also a fairly large legal problem there. So not a lot of folks wanted to wear that t-shirt because you got sued when you wore it at Facebook. So I, I'm not sure I buy that story. Well, you're not accurate in your reply. So I said founders and you're saying advisors could be founders. No, no, no. Employees. I think, Bob, is an employee. Yeah. Employee. I think that founders hasn't worked out very well for him. I know we're talking over each other here. Um, and F and I always come out at the end of the day being uh, nice colleagues and, and friendly. Um, but that I don't agree with advisors are founders. I think he's had some excellent advisory. And I say that- well, I didn't say advisors, Joe. I, I said employees. So, so Bosworth is an employee. He's one of the advisors. early employees. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, I don't know. Like I said, I agreed with you guys before we started this talking over each other, but I just wanted to be a contrarian and say that my perception of outside looking in, it doesn't look that great for founders with Facebook. But I also want to bring up another uh, idea, notion, possibility during this time of 
remote employees is that I think one reason why that we're looking at the Philippines is that we could have a CIO, CTO um, from the very beginning of a small company be a team in the Philippines. And we'd have an advisor or a board director or a VP level consultant manage the strategy, the architecture and have it really be deployed and built in a different country. Um, so that's, I think that's something to really consider in this time, in this daytime. Um, and then I think just the general question that the person asked are, should I have a co-founder? Should I not? I think that depends on your experience. I think that depends on how you have chemistry with other people. Uh, you know, I, you know, ask your, you know, Myers Briggs psychological question, if you should have a co-founder, not us. And it's, and it's very funny because I was mentioning these three companies that did incredibly well for us in our fund one. And, you know, I was just going through it and all of them, there were two co-founders, all the three, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a pattern, just to be clear. I mean, I, I still understand a little bit of statistics to understand it's not a pattern. But it's very funny because all three of them have different qualifications for the co-founders. So one, one of the co-founders was the company spun off from somewhere else. And so one of the co-founders was the person from the original company who then was on the board, but he was actually not deeply involved in the day to day. Uh, the other one, one of the co-founders left after a while um, and then came back and actually took a role in the company, which is funny. Um, and, and the third one, there were two co-founders and there's still two co-founders and they're still there and they've been there for a bunch of time and I don't know if they'll ever do anything by themselves, right? So, yeah. so again, there's different ways that, you know, having co-founders around you can manifest itself and it's not always classically like CEO and something else, CEO, CTO, CEO, COO. It could be in different ways. Okay, um, so somebody asked the panelists to comment on investor interest in fintech or consumer. I guess we hadn't talked about that. And then secondly, B2B software for uh, a collaboration and networking uh, tool, it looks like to me. Anybody want to talk about that? I'll take, I'll take the fintech one um, and it's consumer. We're super excited about fintech in general, but let me be clear. We're talking about fintech. We're not talking about uh, what I call, you know, the equivalent of DTC, direct to consumer 1.0, which is optimizing marketing, SEO, et cetera. And then we get some money out of the interchange rates because something, right? So we're talking about real tech, right? So we're, we're excited about tech. We're excited about financial tech. We're excited about companies that want to serve consumers better with fundamental shifts, at least at product level, ideally with some tech behind it, right? So it's not just, again, interchange arbitrage, marketing optimization, SEO stuff. That's old school. It, it doesn't get you to the next level. You don't win, right? I mean, with all due respect, you don't win. The big financial institutions still have a lot of power in the market. We're interested in stuff that is fundamentally shifting how products are used. Uh, at the very least, ideally with some uh, changes and some significant tech platform changes behind it. Anything else? Okay, question is, will big tech companies with all their cash co-op BC's investment opportunities in technology? How about that? Are you seeing strategics come into the market and, or, or corporate venture capital playing a more prominent role? Yeah, I mean, until, until the COVID you know, crisis hit, CVC was at an all-time peak. You know, we were seeing a lot of, of CVC. You know, there's so many different flavors today. There's on the balance sheet, off the balance sheet, arm's length you know, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it, it's such a broad category. I will say post COVID, uh, unless it was an off balance sheet story, um, you know, they pulled in all the tentacles and at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, the balance sheet investing has turned more of an, an M and A versus an investment story from our perspective. Uh, you know, the off balance sheet guys, they're just VCs with, you know, with a hunting list from, from, from their parent, right? So, you know, they're, they're really out there on their own to a large degree. But yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's a pathway to acquisition. Um, you, know, you know, all the same perils lived there, you know, before. I, I would say, though, you know, the value of cozying up to a big partner today in the COVID crisis uh, has a lot more value than it did before the COVID crisis. Okay. This is an interesting question. How are VCs in other countries dealing with this? Are they different than Silicon Valley VCs? And are you seeing them more in your backyard these days than you did before because of what's going on in the world? Um, you know, so that's really interesting. I mean, you know, we do a lot of work with, uh, 
you know, our, our later stage companies have a lot of, of capital from overseas. You know, uh, at least from our experience right now, uh, European VCs are really challenged. I think that, you know, Europe um, has been a challenge just in terms of market size for a long time. I think the shutdown has further echoed that to a lot of them. Um, you know, I'm getting a lot more outreach from, you know, European colleagues, people I haven't done a deal with in 10 years reaching out, trying to get into U.S. deals. You know, with the closure, uh, you know, I think a lot of this has become very insular, right? N money is not going into China, coming out of China. Uh, you know, a lot of areas like Southeast Asia has been abandoned by a lot of the European investors. It's all gone to the Chinese right now. You know, we're seeing a lot, you know, Chinese are, are very active in Africa right now. In fact, that's sort of the battleground of US, uh, you know, impact funds versus Chinese, you know, government funds. So it's very interesting. I think, I think what, what has happened in this is made a lot of folks worry about the size of their universe. And, you know, with the shutdown, you know, uh, you know, size of market makes a big difference because if you're trying to, you know, peel off little pieces of the market, it's very difficult in, in, in other countries. Okay, well, we are at 1.30. It's too bad. We've got a lot of questions here. I'm kind of, I'd like to know the answers to a lot of these questions myself as I look at them. But unfortunately, we need to be respectful of our panelists' time. We're not going to get to them. Um, if you have contact information, please follow up or just email Rob. He'll answer all those questions for you. Speaking of Rob, I want to bring Rob back. I want to thank our panelists and I want to thank you attendees. Rob, back to you. That was an awesome panel discussion, somewhat entertaining. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you, F, for being with us and sharing your expertise, insights, and your crystal ball. Roger, thanks for moderating. Audience members, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for asking great questions. See you next time. Thanks Thank so you much, guys. everybody.